How would you describe this current period that we are in? Are we in a readjustment to higher rates in this market and, and in a different environment for risk? Of course we are. We are in an environment where um, we're coming off of a decade of zero rates. Uh, think of interest rates as a speed bump. Uh, if there's no speed bump, you get reckless driving. And when it comes to the macro economy, you wind up with uh, malinvestment, misallocation of resources, propping up of zombie companies. Uh, you wind up with corporate welfare. You wind up with a whole array of ills that take time to heal. When rates get too high, you have a speed bump that stops innovation. And so what we lack is a central bank that's willing to have a steady hand at the tiller that paints itself into corners one right after the other. Uh, yield curve inversion is known as one of the best predictors of recession. I would argue yield curve inversion doesn't predict recession. It causes recession by inhibiting innovation, inhibiting investment in new ideas. So what we have right now is an inflation-fueled rise in interest rates which acts against the macro economy. So, Rob, with that in mind, you, you talk about... Good morning uh, from New York. Hi. So the Fed, in your view, has boxed themselves in. Therefore, do I need to countenance what Jamie Dimon has suggested? If they need to take volume out of the system, they may well need to go higher. Is that something that the market just has not been able to even get its head around? It can't get beyond 575. Well, yeah, the, the market can't get its head around uh, rates that go to levels that make no sense. Um, the Fed claims to be data dependent. The data that they pay no attention to is the long bond yield, which is set by supply and demand. It's set by uh, the macro economy and by the uh, competing views of millions of investors. Uh, if you view that as your anchor, mm -hmm. why not simply say, uh, under normal conditions, we should keep the short rate a little below the long rate, uh, half a percent or a percent below the long rate. Australia did that for about 25 years, and Australia has been called the lucky country because it went 30 years without a recession. I think there's no coincidence there. I think recessions are unnecessary, and I know that's a provocative thing to say, and I think central banks often are the uh, proximate cause of recessions when they occur. That is, that is interesting, this idea that, again, it, it limits innovation. But I could counter to you and say, Rob, look look at this world awash in AI, something I know you follow very closely. There's advancements. Um, they're still spending. Corporate balance sheets yeah. are still healthy. What to you says that this curve is creating a recession? Where do you see that happening on the ground? Well, one of the things about central bank policy is it acts with such a lag. So if the notion is let's raise until there's evident slowing, <clears throat> okay, you've baked in. Uh, uh, several quarters of slowing by the time you notice the first evidence of it. And so that's one of the key issues. Um, uh, we have a central bank that, remember back, well, you won't remember, but back in, in the Vietnam War, there was a famous colonel uh, who was quoted saying we had to destroy the village in order to save it. Uh, now, if you're a central banker, you have one tool. You can uh, uh, crush demand. Inflation is caused by supply and demand mismatch. If you have supply ch chain di disruptions, if you mm -hmm. have people working from home or being paid not to work from home, being paid to simply stay home, if you have people pretending to work from home, all of these things reduce supply of goods and services. If you have airdrops of money into people's accounts, that increases demand. And as a consequence of the supply-demand mismatch, you have inflation. Unless there's a willingness to recognize that policy choices caused inflation, then there's not likely to be policy choices to reverse those causes of inflation. Well, you, you talk about the supply and demand argument there, Rob, and undoubtedly the supply side was, was the COVID angst. Here we are, the helicopter money is done. We've just spent time with yeah. ICAP talking about the cracks in the consumer. The savings rate is dropping. The amount of disposable income that Americans have and indeed around the world is dropping. Morgan Stanley warned right. that this fissure can turn into a gusher. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? And how do you position for that if you agree with the thesis? Well, I do agree with the thesis. I think that um, uh, we're laying a foundation for 
relatively high odds of recession, increasing odds of a hard landing and an unnecessary hard landing. Uh, I would love to see a central bank simply take a, uh, a very patient, uh, steady hand at the tiller approach and uh, anchor on the long rate minus a little. Uh, that's not been done. Uh, long rate minus a little would mean you never got to zero. You went from zero to two percent mm -hmm. in one single move. That would have been uh, a step in the right direction. But taking it uh, up from current levels, I think, builds on the risk of a hard landing. Okay. Now, you, you also mentioned that rates don't make sense where they are. What, what would make sense, Rob? Well, as I said, long rates minus a little. Yeah. So if the is long there, rates are four and a half, yeah. if there's the long rates are four and a half, why not take the Fed funds rate to four? So you think they should be cutting at this point potentially? I think they should be cutting. I th um, now all of this has a lot to do with markets and a lot to do with the value growth cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. One of the things that's happened this year is tumbling inflation expectations on the back of rolling 12-month inflation that keeps getting better and better through June. Mm -hmm. Well, why was that? First half of uh, last year, we had 6% inflation in the U.S. Second half of last year, we had half a percent. So that means the first half of the year, this year, we were replacing 1% a month on average. Mm -hmm. Second half, we're replacing a tenth of a percent a month. So back in January, we, we predicted that inflation would hit about 3% at mid-year. Uh, in fact, our forecast was 2.9 um, and would snap back to 5.7 yeah. by the end of the year. I still think 4.5 to 5.5 is a likely year-end range. Okay. That's going to shock people. It shouldn't shock people because... Um, all, all we're doing and dealing with is a base effect. Rob, you left us with a tantalizing thought, which was we will be in shock, uh, or the markets will be in shock, because inflation will be a lot higher than perhaps they anticipate, 45 to 5%. Roll that into growth to value, because logic to me is if inflation is in the upper fours, then I don't want to be long growth, do I? That's exactly right. What, what we find is that there's a relationship between interest rates and the growth value cycle. It's not a strong relationship. There's a relationship between inflation and the growth value cycle. That one is strong. So when you have inflation expectations tumbling, as mm -hmm. we did in the first half of the year, based on an illusion of falling rates, because the comparisons the year earlier were a percent a month, uh, that illusion of tumbling inflation fueled, helped to fuel the surge in growth relative to value. Now we're experiencing the reverse of that. Plus, people are starting to ask, okay, is the AI miracle all, at, all as miraculous as is commonly perceived? Markets are driven by narratives, and that narrative is starting to get some questions. That's the thing, though. It's starting to get questions, but are we there yet? I look at ARM, for example. Traded below its IPO price, but now it's back above it, $54. I'm mm -hmm. going to be honest, Manis and I were talking, and we said to one another, all right, we have to ask Rob, it's below its IPO price. Are we finally there? It's not. It's not anymore. <laughs> it gained again yesterday. I mean, have we finally come to terms about what this means for big tech? I pay very little attention to day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week <laughs> movements. Keeps you sane, a, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. On a long horizon basis, uh, there's a concept called uh, big market delusion which was pioneered by uh, 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 Brad Cornell, former professor at Caltech. Uh, it, big market delusion basically says if there's a brand new concept that people know is going to be big, could be the internet, it could be electric vehicles, it could be AI, uh, the narrative will tend to get ahead of itself. And the narrative embraces the notion that the powerful players in that big market will remain the powerful players 10 years hence. That it ignores the fact that the, they're competing against one another. It ignores the fact that there are a few winners and a lot of losers in any new big market. It ignores the fact that new competitors come on the scene. And so with big market delusion, you get the creation of bubbles. Mm. This reminds me a lot of the internet bubble. The narrative was the internet will change everything. It'll change how we get our news how we interact with friends and family, how we uh, communicate in business. It'll change how we buy and sell goods and services. And uh, don't worry about earnings because they're coming. That narrative was correct. Mm. Narratives are often correct. 
that narrative was wrong only in the sense that it didn't happen as fast. Rob, with that, with that in expected. mind, I mean, essentially what you're channeling is the Alan Greenspan speech, which was made uh, about the paradigm shift of the internet. Um, and yes, it took a few years to get there. I'm drawn to the one word. Mm -hmm. I'm trashy, but I want to know where the biggest bubbles are. You know, where is the myth and legend? <laughs> we, we've seen some repricing in equities. I put that down to profit taking. We've seen a little bit of a spike in bond yields. I wouldn't call it vigilanteism. So where is the propensity for bubble? Dollars at a year high. Where is the biggest bubble for you outside of AI? Or is that the singular biggest risk to markets that it pops? I think, I think that uh, represents a risk. I think crypto repre represents a smaller risk. Uh, there are, uh, if you look at AI, the narrative's correct. This is going to change everything. But it's going to change everything gradually. And that's the gap that makes the difference. We wrote a paper recently, the AI uh, NVIDIA singularity, mm. in which we pose the question, is this a breakthrough, a bubble, or both? And to cut to the chase, yep. uh, our view is that it's both. Yeah. Um, how, how then, though, if everyone's obsessed with that at this moment, Bank of America in years past have talked about it as the Pavlovian urge to buy big tech. How does value outperform? You say that they're growing, but they're not loved. What changes to make them loved? Uh, the tailwinds for value in the coming couple couple of years uh, and extending out over very likely the coming decade mm -hmm. are very simple. Firstly, it is near record cheapness. It reached an all-time record cheapness by many measures, relative price to book, relative price to sales, relative price to cash flow. Record cheapness relative to growth in the summer of 2020. Now, uh, the, the narrative that got it there was very plausible narrative that had large doses of truth. It bounced back to test those lows near the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. It bounced back to test those lows in the summer of 2023. You don't often get a triple bottom. You don't often get a third bite at the apple when something gets abnormally cheap. And then the question is, what would be the catalysts that can allow things to turn? One of them is inflation being stickier, longer lasting than expected. One of them could be higher interest rates, meaning a higher discount rate for the long-term growth of the growth stocks. One of them could be higher instability in the economy. There's no such thing as high but stable inflation. Instability works to the detriment of growth because um, you wind up having people seeking a margin of safety. They want the underlying earnings. They want the dividends. And in addition to that, you have the risk that the Fed engineers another recession, um, almost deliberately, uh, and in so doing, creates further headwinds and further catalyst for the bursting of a bubble. Okay. Rob, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Really wonderful to have you on. Rob Arnott of Research Affiliates, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much.